But today we're talking about uh, dining cryptographer networks, sometimes called DC nets. Um, and the paper is called Unconditional Sender and Recipient Trace, uh, Untraceability. Um, so we're looking at a paper that examines DC nets from 2012 by Haribold. But really, um, and I've, I've sort of done this myself, um, we're really looking at the 1988 uh, dining cryptographer's problem uh, by the creator of, of both the problem and the solution, which is David Chown. Um, you can find links to both papers here, or, of course, you can always find them on the GitHub uh, for the Wasabi Club. Um, so last week, just to remind ourselves what we were doing, we talked about an issue with CoinJoin implementations um, with respect to the resilient, uh, reliance on a central coordinator. So removing the coordinator would require some secure method of participants declaring their anonymous addresses, uh, ideally anonymously, so that other participants can't de-anonymize them in the coin join. Um, with coin shuffle, we can replace the coordinator with a shuffling of the coins, where each participant onion encrypts their address with the public keys of the latter participants. They then decrypt and shuffle all encrypted addresses they have received with their own address, and then hand off all the encrypted addresses to the next participant. So essentially, we talked to, uh, about creating this like shuffle mix net. Um, we talked about how it scales poorly with many participants. Uh, the more participants you have, more participants need to be included, and the more participants in this link. And if one participant fails to, you know, uh, uh, shuffle and pass on the date information, then uh, the entire thing fails. And as a side note, Electron Cash which is the Bitcoin Cash coin join implementation of coin shuffle currently has this uh, uh, working with five participants. So this gives you a sense about how well this type of thing scales. Um, yeah. Um, so this is what we've been doing up until now for next week. We will decide uh, the paper at the end of this call and everything is available on our GitHub. Okay. So let's talk about the dining cryptographers. Um, so the, what's the premise? The premise is that three cryptographers are sitting down to dinner at their favorite three-star restaurant. Uh, the waiter informs them that arrangements have been made with the maitre d' uh, uh, for the hotel uh, for the bill to be paid anonymously. One of the cryptographers might be paying for the dinner, or it might have been the NSA. Uh, the three cryptographers respect each other's right to making an anonymous payment, but they wonder if the NSA is paying. They resolve their uncertainty fairly by carrying out the following protocol. So just being very clear here, there are three cryptographers at dinner. The participants are all trustworthy. These cryptographers all trust each other, and they're acting in, 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 in as honestly as they can towards each other and towards the protocol. The participants want to be able to tell if someone in the group paid. So if, if someone paid, they would like to be able to reveal that, but they don't want to out the payer because that person deserves the right to be able to pay anonymously. So we essentially want to know this information. We don't want anyone to reveal if it was them. Uh, so let's visualize this. So here we, we have three cryptographers at a dinner table. Um, what we're going to do, this is the solution, uh, the protocol that Chom uh, explains in, in his 1988 paper. He says, uh, you know, orange is going to turn to his right and he's going to put up a menu so that green can't see. And he's going to flip a, a, a coin to get a, uh, essentially a one or a zero shared secret between himself and, uh, and Pink. And then Pink is going to open his menu and in a very covert way, uh, flip a coin between him, him and, and, and Green and create a shared secret. In this case, the zero might be heads and the one might be tails, for example. And lastly, Green is going to turn to orange, flip a coin, and write down a shared secret. So uh, these numbers are only known between the two individuals on that side of the table. Uh, so, um, you know, green is unaware of the number between orange and pink. Uh, okay. And so what they're going to do is each participant themselves is going to XOR the value. Uh, an exclusive OR just means that if you have the same number, uh, you write zero. So if you have one and one, that's a zero, 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 that's a one, or that's a zero as well. But if you have different numbers, like a one and a zero or a zero and a one, then you simply have the number one. Uh, so every individual is going to take their two numbers and, it, and they're going to XOR those numbers uh, in their own heads. So in this case, we have, you know, orange has a one and a one, that's a zero. Uh, 
green has a one and a zero, that's a one, and then pink has a one and a zero, and that's a, that's a one. So and should, should uh, play it? yeah, yeah, we, we can absolutely play it. So we, we can play it right now in real time um, by taking the participants in this chat. And firstly, we have to decide on an order. So, uh, Adam, do you want to just call out the names in order and uh, and get them to do a, a shared secret? Uh, well, uh, the very first thing is that I'm going to be the waiter, right? Because someone has to decide who is paying, right? So I, okay. will, I will send someone a message in private that he's, play, he's paying. Okay, so I'm the waiter. I came here and I tell you guys that, hey guys, your your bill has been paid. Now, you want to figure out if it's one of you or the NSA. So, let's do that. Uh, Excellent. So what we'll do is we first need everyone to remember a shared secret. We're going to do this in public, um, which is not secure, but uh, but just remember your shared secret. So what we're going to do is we're going to start with, uh, with Igor and Lucas and just, uh, I guess, uh, who wants to uh, announce the, wait, wait, the number? Wait, Igor has to tell his secret to Lucas. Lucas has to tell his secret to Raphael. You, Raphael has to tell his secret to Yuval, and Yuval has to tell his secret to you, Aviv. Okay. okay. So the communication, the secure communication channel in this case is that don't remember other people's secret, only the secret that's been told to you. So, Igor. Yeah. So I'm uh, just saying the number, right? Zero one, right? Okay, yes. zero. All right, you, Lucas, do you remember that? Now say your secret to Rafael. Oh, sorry, zero. Okay, Rafael, remember that and say your secret to Yuval. All right, uh, one. All right, well, remember that and say your secret to Aviv. Zero. Aviv and Igor. Uh, one. Awesome. Now there is the exclusive information, right? I think it's three ones and two zeros, so one overall. Uh, no, uh, uh, don't you, you exclusive or your secret? The, the, the secret that the secret. That's right. So you 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 want to just take the the secret of that you have between you and the person to your left and the person to your right. Uh, so Igor. Um, the, the, you only care about your secret with Lucas and your secret with me because that's where we are in the circle. Yeah, yeah, I understand. So whoever I sent the message that he paid, he has to negate his result. So let's start over, Igor. One. Lucas. Uh, the XOR is zero. Rafael? Mm, the XOR was one. You are? The XOR is one. And Aviv? The XOR is um, one. All right, so we have the XORs. And yeah, you can go or, or yeah, let, let just the, 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 the messages are one, zero, one, one, one. So what's the XR of that? So that, that, that's a four, 
which is even, which means that no one paid. Uh huh. Because I didn't send the message to anyone. So that's. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. All right. So I hope we learned something from this. <laughs> At least we learned that, that I cannot do X. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Aviv. Yeah, no problem. Okay. So, uh, you know, uh, what just happened is all, all participants in the circle, right? The circle can have as many participants as you want. But the rule is you look to your left and to your right and you establish a single secret. And in this case, we're going to take a one-bit secret. So we, we already did that, took our one-bit secret, and then every individual has to XOR that, right? So if it's a one and a zero, that's a one. If it's two zeros, it's a zero. If it's two ones, it's a zero. XOR just means exclusive or. So it means either this or that, but not both. Um, that's all that XOR is. Another way of thinking about XOR is thinking if the numbers are different. If you have a different number on your left than on your right, your XOR value is one. If it's the same number, it's zero. Okay, so now every individual knows their own XOR, right? They can now state their XOR uh, in the public message, right? So this is step two, phase two is the public message. In this case, green says one, orange says zero, uh, pink says one. And what we do is we sum up all of the numbers that we get. We sum them all up. And in this case, everyone gets the same result, which is two. If the, if the sum is even, right, it means that nobody said anything. So in this case, because nobody said anything, we know the NSA is the one that paid. It wasn't one of the members sitting at the table because no one said anything, right? So that, that is the protocol. Now, suppose that Orange did, in fact, pay for the dinner. Well, in this case, Orange is going to say one. If you look at Orange's secrets, Orange has a one and a one, which means the XOR should be a zero. But Orange isn't going to say a zero. Orange is going to negate that to say one. So now all three participants are going to say what they have, and they're going to add up all the results, which is one plus one plus one is three, and they're going to get the result that someone uh, uh, paid, someone at the table paid. Now you might think to yourself, well, wait a second. Um, hey, sorry, can someone mute themselves? It's it's getting uh, very loud. Lucas, I think that's you. Lucas. Sorry, sorry. sorry. It, it, it's very loud. Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. Oh, that's nice. Okay. Um, yes, uh, so, um, so why does this work? Why does this work? Well, let's take pink as an example. So just pretend like you are pink and this is all you know about the network. What you know is that you have a shared secret with green and you have a shared secret with, with orange. And you know this, the shared secrets. And, uh, and then you say uh, uh, in public your XOR, which is one. And you're, you're, uh, you're pink, you didn't pay. And now you're thinking to yourself, can I figure out if orange or uh, green paid. Well, suppose you think orange paid, right? If orange paid, it means that orange has a one with, with green. That's their shared secret. However, if you think green paid, it means that uh, green has a zero with orange. Now, the problem is that you don't know that information. And whether orange or green paid is entirely based on whether that number between them is a zero or a one. So uh, the, the, what, what orange and green are saying reveals nothing about whether either of them paid or not. Um, so all you know is that the sum of the messages you heard was odd, and so that means that someone paid. And that's fundamentally what, 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 what's going on. And you don't know if it was Alice or Bob, in this case, orange or green. So why is it always even? This is actually an interesting question. Why is it always even? Well, I want you to imagine... Uh, instead of a circle, a line, you know, orange, um, um, purple, green, back to orange, right? Uh, 
the shared secrets between participants, if it changes, if it goes from zero to one, then the participant that experiences that change, in this case it's pink, essentially has a value of one. But if it stays the same as is, as is the case with, with green, like it's a flat line above green, then it's a zero. Um, so if you notice something interesting, because it can only oscillate between zero and one, and it's a circle, it must always have an even number of increasing times and decreasing times. So it can never have an odd number because it's a circle, right? So if it started at one and then it goes down and then it goes up and then it goes down and then it goes back up, it has to end at the same place, then it will always be an even number. And it doesn't matter um, how many. So for example, if all the numbers were the same, like the number one, then there would be a zero uh, total sum. That's also even. Um, but even if you add more participants and you have all sorts of uh, clever ways to um, separate the numbers, the number of downs and ups is always in total an even number. In this case, four. It's gone down twice and up twice because it has to end in the same place. So just a quick summary of the protocol. Phase one, we have a one-bit secret that must be shared between each participant and their two neighbors, regardless of how many participants there are. Phase two is each participant must XOR their two shared secrets and then broadcast the resulting one-bit message. And then two prime is if you are the payer or if you want to send a message, simply flip the result of the XOR and broadcast the resulting one-bit message. And then phase three is that given all of the messages that we've just heard, we collect all of them and we sum them. And if the sum is even, the message is zero. If it's odd, the message is one. Okay, um, so I'm going to just stop for a second and just ask, is anyone unclear about at least the one-bit protocol for uh, DCNet? Is anyone unclear? A a any questions? It is clear for me. Yep. Okay. Great. So we're going to move a little bit. We're going to move uh, forward. Um, so we can generalize uh, DC networks with this uh, XOR symbol. So essentially what this is saying is that um, the message for any number of bits for any K participants is, uh, is essentially the XOR of all their participants' messages, which and each participant's XOR is the XOR of the secret on the left, the secret on the right, and the message they have themselves. They XOR all of those together. And that's XOR with everyone else's, and, this, and the, uh, um, the final result is the message from, uh, from some participant um, in total. Um, okay, so now I want to show a quick example uh, of how this would work with, uh, um, this would work more visually. So I'm going to share screen. Okay, can everyone see this uh, this setup here? Yes. Okay, so I'm I'm, I'm going to reenact this entire protocol with uh, essentially a logic circuit simulator, and you can see the three phases up at the top. Don't worry about the bottom. The first is the shared secret. The second is broadcast message, and the third is interpret group message. So starting from the left, um, starting from the left. Uh, what I have here is just a random number generator. I click this little clock button and it lets me create new shared secrets. So uh, it, it, in this case, we have a secret between A and B is, uh, is a one, because that's, that's bright green. And then the secret between B and C is a zero. And the secret between C and A is a, is, is a, a one. Now over here, I'm gonna have the broadcast message component, right? So right now, neither A, B, nor C, none of them are saying anything. But the result is that uh, B and C both have uh, positive messages, both have a, a one message. And if we look at the far right, to interpret the group message, I just have this uh, last little uh, logical circuit set up. Um, and you can see that no cryptographer has paid, given what these uh, uh, individuals have said. Um, so now I'm going to show you just by clicking, if B changes the message, in this case, clicks like this, 
then you can see that um, we get an odd number of um, uh, of of red lights, and uh, the result is that uh, we have a one at the far right. So um, uh, a cartographer has paid. Um, yeah, and now I'm going to turn on the clock. And what the clock is essentially going to do is it's going to start rounds. And so each round, you can see, there, there are new shared secrets and therefore uh, new setups between A, B, and C. So you can see here, even as many rounds happen, uh, the message at the end here is the same. No cryptographer has paid. Now, if I click on this message over here on behalf of C, um, now we can see on the right, it says a cryptographer has paid, uh, bright green. But if you, if you just focus your eyes on the red dots, it's not clear that C is the pair because the lights flicker just as they did before, kind of randomly. Does, is, is this kind of making sense to anyone? Did anyone get anything out of this? Because uh, it, it might be a bit much. Um, it, it okay. Makes sense. It's, uh, if, if, if you understand these gates, then you can make sense everyone learns it in university then forgets it of course but yeah <laughs> okay awesome so uh the one last thing i wanted to show before we we end this this uh um powerpoint is just uh is just and maybe this is uh too much but uh okay um, so I have the same thing set up here, um, and I, I know it can feel like a lot, um, but uh, uh, essentially uh, over here to the right is a, an output. It's essentially like um, like a board, um, which l lets you type letters in. And over here we have five participants this time, and they have a eight bit message this time, not a one bit message. What we're going to do is we're going to pick a random individual, for example, over here, B, and uh, you can see that the rounds are happening very quickly and all the time. If I start typing, um, I paid for dinner, you will see it appear on the far right over here. Um, but uh, if you just focus your eyes on the red dots, then you can't tell um, who paid. So I can type over here, I paid for dinner. Okay. Anyways, uh, that's pretty much it. You can download Logisim for free, and you can copy my. Um, you can copy my um, project and uh, and try it for yourself. Okay, so let's finish this then. Uh, can you um, explain what the correspondence is between the eight bit number and the uh, text message? Say, say again. The I don't understand the correspondence between the text that you typed and the 8-bit result. Okay, great question, Yuval. So the, the point was um, the point was that uh, um, that uh, when I was typing, I was typing on behalf of one of the five participants, right? Pretending to be one of the five participants that actually had something to say to the rest of the group. Um, but all of the participants are constantly engaging in these rounds where they get this 8-bit secret between their, their neighbors and they keep publishing messages, except everyone is publishing blank messages because no one has anything to say. So as I'm typing, what's happening in real time is the rounds are happening many, many, very quickly. That's why the flashing lights are flashing. And the output is what the group message is, the, 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 uh, the, uh, the final message as XORed by the entire group. So is it like one byte of the message at a time? Exactly, it's one byte at a time. We get we, we get a one byte uh, secret anonymous group message sent to all participants because all participants engaged with one byte of of the protocol instead of one byte. broadcasting. Then you just get a string of zero bytes, right? Exactly. Right, and if you wanted to, for example, broadcast the number, you know, ten, which is one zero one zero in binary, right? You would broadcast zero 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 one zero one zero. So in, it, it's still the case that most of the protocol is empty, 
except for those two one bits and their respective locations. And so the to- the net result is a byte um, uh, with the number 10. Thanks. That makes sense. Okay, great. So now uh, we're going to talk about the issues. So um, I had a lot of fun learning about DC nets and I spent a long time just, I really enjoy reading all the different papers. Um, uh, the sad news is, is that no matter how cool or fun they are, they're very impractical. So we're going to talk about why they're impractical. The first is that they demand a lot of bandwidth. So for starters, if you want to say a message to uh, uh, in your group, then uh, if your message is, for example, one megabyte and there are N participants, let's say 10, then it requires all of your peers to also message a one megabyte blank message that is XOR to your message. So the more participants there are, the more needless bandwidth is being wasted, right? Also, it could be the case that you have rounds where no one has anything to say. In that case, you have an empty message, but it still costs uh, M times N in size. Um, There's also really, really critical flaw, which is that only one participant is allowed to message the group per round. So th- th- there's, it's, it's actually not entirely true that only one group, uh, one participant is allowed to message per round. The more accurate thing to say is that for any bit, for any like byte or bit or whatever in the protocol, only one participant can fill that bit with a message. Um, if you have two participants speaking at the same time, uh, the round actually collapses in on itself. And so you, you start to negate the message of one person with the message of the other. And so for this reason, it's actually quite trivial to break a DC net. So in order to break a DC net, all you need to do is not be not cooperate. Either talk all the time or uh, not properly message your XOR or do any of the other potential things, and then you will uh, successfully uh, break the, um, the DC net. Um, so, yeah, uh, that's pretty much it. I didn't want to take too much time to leave it up to... Um, yeah, so by following a strict protocol of three phases per round, we can establish truly anonymous communication for any of the participants so long as their shared secrets remain secret. Benefits, we could use DC nets for cogent participants who want to anonymously broadcast their outputs to the group. And the downsides is a very fragile system, easily broken by malicious participants that's also quite a bit slower. Um, yeah, so I'll just leave it at uh, with one thing. Uh, suppose Wasabi wanted... Uh, our participants to um, to uh, do a DC net for their own uh, addresses, right? So suppose we have you know uh, ten Wasabi wallet users. They want to do a DC net and uh, push their addresses. One clever thing we can do to deal with the problem of two individuals interrupting each other is by having a very large round with a very large amount of data, like for example one megabyte, and have uh, each participant take the one megabyte, um, create two one megabyte shared secrets with the adjacent participants. Um, and by the way, shared secrets are easily uh, created with Diffie Hellman key exchange if we're using public key uh, cryptography. Um, and, uh, and and essentially have users input their address somewhere in the one megabyte um, block but um, um, such that all the participants could fit and that ideally uh, no two participants would overlap each other. But uh, I think there's some definitely some challenges there. Um, Yeah. Anyways, that's pretty much it, I think, for me. Thank you, Aviv. So I couldn't get the authors to come here uh, actually, there is one author and I couldn't find his contact because it wasn't on the paper. Uh, I, I sent an email to Chaum too. Uh, he did not reply. So anyway, uh, I couldn't get the authors. But I would have one fun question for the author. And please, if you know the answer, then, then, then say it. So the paper says... Perfect security is often realized using some physical means such as flipping a coin behind a menu card or more seriously personally handing over a hard drive disk containing key bits. 
And my question is, is this really often being realized in practice? <laughs> so are people doing that? The hard drive, this stuff. The hard drive, this that is containing bits for this protocol. No, no, yes, uh, I really don't think so. I don't know the answer. I don't think so. Uh, however, I think that the, the I don't remember the the paper because I I read it a, a long time ago. But uh, the problem. I think it's the how to get a long enough key because if you want to share, for example, um, a, a movie, a uh, four gigabytes uh, file, for example, then you need a four gigabyte uh, key, right? Uh, so how to get that? Uh, yes, you can have a hard drive <laughs> with a, a a, a long enough key but you can also derivate I mean uh, deterministically from one no so big key to a one really really long so in my opinion the the length of the key is not is not really a problem in fact we are at all our uh, derivation schemes for private and public keys in bitcoins in the Bitcoin ecosystem are using uh, key derivation functions for very small keys, right? So I think it's not a problem. That, that's exactly, uh, actually, this is one of my discussion topic because this, uh, this gave me an idea about Wasabi that yes, this is what they are saying in the paper that we claim that if we initially exchange key generators rather than continually exchanging the keys itself, the network only requires a linear amount of bandwidth in N. Um, yeah, so, so exactly what you just said, it's in the paper. So this is really interesting because it is similar to HD wallets, right? That's what you said. And it could be directly applied to Wasabi too. Because, you know, in Wasabi, with the synchronized request, we are actually um, sending keys all the time with the synchronized request, right? Because there is the there are two, two attacks there somehow, uh, why we needed to do that. But it's actually not needed. We could just use these key generators, HD wallets, and we could... We could we could save a lot of bandwidth uh, for ourselves too. I'm not uh, suggesting to start working on it, but uh, I think that could work and that would be awesome. Yes, I, I agree. I, I didn't think about that, but yes, it makes sense. I, I would like to to share my, my it's not my thought, it's just a, uh, how this can be used in a, a, a small different way but I don't know if I can share my screen can I? I mean it's up to you it's being recorded so okay. okay okay let me see yes I think everything is okay <laughs> okay I will share my screen close then the porn. close the porn <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Okay. Allow. Let me know if you can see my screen. Yes. Okay. okay. Imagine E is Igor um, messaging key, right? Let's call it that. Uh, this is a VIV. Yes, that it has another random. I don't know. Uh, this is me with another another key. Yes, very small, but they can be uh, as long as as needed, right? So now someone that we don't know who. Ah, of course, we all know 
the Igor Key, the Aviv Key, and my key. We all know that. So if you receive a message, for example, someone, Igor, Aviv, or me, wants to send this message to you, for example, or, or yes, for example, to you, Adam, right? So what we do is the encrypted message, let's call it encrypted message, will be the message, right? With XOR, the keys of we, right? This is the en encrypted message. What you can do then is decrypt the message, the encrypted message will be the encrypted message, right? By yeah, the, the order is, is not important, right? Because it's an XOR, yes? So you have the, ooh, the decrypt, oh, yeah, wait, wait. The decrypted message, oh, wow. The decrypted message, that is one, two, three, four. So you get the message, but you really don't know who sent you that message, right? So uh, this is something that can be used for communication the only problem we have is the IP address. But if we can hide the IP address in some way, uh, for example, some operating systems allow you to to, to change the, the IP address in, in, in UDP uh, packages, right? So you really don't know. I mean, put a, a fake IP, for example, right? So you can send messages in this way, and you really don't know who sent the message. So this is something that basically can be used. And I don't know if this is useful. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know Does it make sense? Sure. Yeah, I don't know either. I think this is the 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 the, the, the most uh, important application. I will stop sharing. All right. So, thank you. anyone has anything to add to that? Uh, one thing we haven't really discussed, uh, but I think is really relevant for the like the. The context of um, coin joins is uh, how do you establish the secure channels between the peers? Um, it's related to that. I mean, it's the same passage as the, the physical uh, device part in the, in the, the paper. Um, is, is the assumption that you use the prior UTXOs to uh, do key agreement over those and like you authenticate the other participants? Um, based on the coins that they registered in Pumix? Sorry, I changed my headphone and... Uh, sorry. <laughs> okay. It's, it's, sorry, but I, I I understand your your problem, which is how do you how do you bootstrap the system, right? Which which this the, how do you in generally how do you bro bootstrap a peer to peer network? But about, but this paper was not uh, not talking about that. Go ahead if I misunderstand something. Uh, no, no that, that that's exactly it. Like, um, I, I haven't yet read the Coin Shuffle Plus Plus paper, so um, I was just wondering, indeed, how how do you bootstrap, and is the the general approach uh, to use the UTXOs going into the mix in order to authenticate the participants? Uh, yeah, so Coin Shuffle Plus Plus paper is going to be next week, and if I remember well, it does not talk about that. 
it just talks about that as it is a general problem a peer-to-peer -peer network is already given now this is what we can do on the peer-to-peer -peer network so it, it doesn't uh, talks about bootstrapping but yeah it's it's not an easy problem because think about bitcoin core maybe the most peer-to-peer -peer network ever and what do we do with bitcoin core we are connecting to some core developers at the very first start those uh, those nodes the address of their nodes are hard coded into bitcoin core and that's how you are bootstrapping it and what did you do before uh, you were you were in in satoshi's time you were going to the, an irc server and that's how you bootstrap bootstrapped your bitcoin core so based on that bitcoin core is using a centralized way to semi-centralized way to bootstrap i would say there is probably no good solution for that i mean the solutions are practical and good but there is no ideal solution maybe well, so in Bitcoin specifically, there's, you know, uh, the criticism against uh, BIP-151 where you can't really authenticate the other peers. So, um, but I don't think it's the same because in this context, uh, every member, specifically in the context of using these protocols for uh, mixing coins, uh, since people come in with UTXOs, if they expose the public key for that UTXO, um that's um, like some sort of identity anchor. Um, so uh, to, to me, it doesn't seem like an unsolvable problem specifically in this context um, because it's only a communication about a, a particular set of coins. Uh, also, your, your question is not about how do the peers find each other? Um, not in general. It is, but... Um, I mean, it, it depends what you mean by find, but uh, specifically I'm concerned about... Um, so in the paper, the the secrecy um, basically falls apart if you have an adversary that can eavesdrop uh, on everything, right? Because it, it can just see which one of the participants... Like, if it sees both secrets of every participant, then it can basically see uh, whether or not their message was one or zero. Um, so you need to have a secure channel to your um, your left and right um, neighbors. Yes, that's um, correct. And uh, again, th there's no nothing discussed about how, how to bootstrap that um, apart from you know physical drives and stuff. But specifically in the context of, of Bitcoin mixing, um, I, I was wondering um, if uh, the, the UTXOs going into the mix can be used as um, identifiers where you can basically do uh, kind of like stealth addresses, uh, like diffie Hellman key agreement on the public keys of those UTXOs um, in order to like um, establish the other participants' identities. Yeah, possibly, uh, I, I guess. But you know, like this this protocol that we talked about is so flawed in from so many point of view that you have to fix a lot of things, like the honesty problem. Uh, you have to fix a lot of things, and I think only after then you can think about how to how to exchange keys in a secure channel with each other because that would that would uh, depend on the final scheme the final solution all right i uh, i have a bigger topic regarding the paper which was not mentioned but it was a large uh, large part of the paper and and when he analyzed attacks against anonymity, did anyone who who thinks here who understand the attacks against anonymity section uh, pretty well, who understood it? Okay, it was probably the most difficult 
part of it so here is my my conclusion so the anonymity set is n all the participants of the protocol that's n unless an attacker participates in this case the anonymity set of honest participants is n minus one so far it's clear n is the number of participants n minus one is the anonymity set if an attacker is participates however if the attacker participates with multiple participants things become more interesting in this case the anonymity set of honest participants is the honest component of the gra graph so this is what the paper says what does this mean so for example if the attacker controls the keys of both neighbor of a participant then the participants anonymity set against the attacker is one p had been the participants had been Sibyl attacked right it's it's understandable and yes and 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 next however if the graph is fully connected then the attacker can only reduce the anonymity set by one now last week we talked about coin shuffle and I had the misunderstanding of coin shuffle that the the graph is fully connected but you guys were like no you can uh, pass messages to so you guys were talking about the circular graph and I was talking about the fully connected graph and I think this uh, this is the same scenario that that in, in Aviv's explanation the circular nature of coin shuffle uh, I, I think or, or, or yeah this is my question does this app apply to coin shuffle that if the participant if an attacker participates with multiple participants then the anonymity set of the honest participants is the honest component of the graph does this apply to coin shuffle that's that's my question i think coin shuffle is more secure is my intuition in that if so if only one participant is tasked with shuffling um and they decide to do it wrong Yeah, I'm, I'm not entirely sure. All right, so wishful thinking fails us. We are not gonna find answer to this question, but it would be interesting. Anyway, uh, I have one last small thing that uh, the paper says, we will leave the question of why this is an unobservable anonymity system to the reader and instead obtain a basic generalization of the restaurant protocol before moving on to attacks. So why is this an unobservable anonymity system? Anyone? Because it's it uses the principle of XOR, like the, the fact that all you know about the entire system is that there must be an even number of of uh, ups and downs, so to speak, of, of differences. And if you get an odd number, you don't know where, who it was the person that caused that problem. There's no, nothing is revealed. And what would the unobservability mean? that the messages given by the individuals um, are uh, uh, don't give any insight in terms of whether what the individuals themselves wanted to say whether they wanted to say something or nothing uh -huh. so, that's what's happening. so if 
if we have a protocol like the Tor network where you are ups, you, you are observing all the Tor network messages, that's an observable anonymity system because it relies on on the fact that the that there are honest there are secure communications between some peers. But in this case it doesn't matter, everyone can broadcast their messages to everyone and whoever observes it cannot know anything. That's the, is that the point here? Yeah. All right. Uh, okay. I'm not sure I follow, but like the, the way that the paper defines unobservability, um, I mean, it, it's pretty pretty clearly defined. It's just that the messages are, uh, each message is completely indistinguishable from random noise. Uh, I think also to the participants, not just to uh, like an adversary monitoring the, the network. Yes, exactly. Because the messages are essentially an XOR of, of two random pieces of data, right? Two shared secrets that are random. So um, yeah. So I'm, I'm not sure how like to compare this to like onion routing because th there's no notion of broadcast there. Um, yeah, like each is, is sent just to a specific peer. That is the point. If you would be, I mean, I think that is the point. If you would be able to observe all the communication between that's being broadcasted to the network? Actually, I don't know. Be because you have to assume secure communication channels, even here too. So what's the difference there? You're, you're a good question. I, I mean, I, I don't even see how the, the definition a a applies. Like, I don't see how either unlinkability or unobservability as defined in the paper uh, really relates to the, the onion routing case where each message is intended just for a, a single participant. Uh, like it's, uh, if, if Alice is uh, trying to talk to Bob via Carol or something, then she sends to Carol a single message that uh, Carol then forwards to Bob. Um, but th there's no, like, uh, of course, the messages are linkable by Carol because Alice sent them, and and um, you break unlinkability by uh, having different messages. Um, so, like Carol can link Alice's messages to the message that she sent to Bob on Alice's behalf. Um, but since there's no like, uh, like Bob doesn't see Alice's message to Carol; he only sees Carol's like message to him. Um, I I don't see how the like how it's uh, the the same notion the same property is is um like how you can even examine it in in the case of uh onion routing yeah you is 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 right right so here when it talks about unobservability it says that um you know actual messages sent from the actors from from the participants are indistinguishable from random noise an unobservable system not only conceals who is communicating with whom, but also hides which actor actually sent or received messages in the face of a passive global attacker. So uh, Tor isn't like that, right? Um, you know, for Tor, if you if you send a message, it's not hidden among many other messages. Um, you would have to do that. You would have to make sure that it's unobservable. Uh, but but there's also nothing like you've all said. It's 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 a completely different system. So, um, yeah. Okay, that that was from me. So whoever sure, was the topic. I wasn't asserting anything. I just um, like I, I didn't understand what, how how you um, like Nopara. If you if you want to explain more, um, like uh, it's just that I I didn't understand what you meant. Not uh, not that I think that you're wrong. Yeah, because I was thinking out loud. I, I, so my initial thinking was that the message that's being broadcasted in dining cryptographers is the is the 
XORs. So whoever observes that XORs, it doesn't matter. You cannot make any conclusion out of that. But then I was saying that in Tor, the message that's being broadcasted is the actual communication between the many parties in Tor. So observing that is obviously dangerous. Now, but you pointed out that this is not correct because even in dining cryptographers, there is a private communication. What? But if you are observing it, then you are de-anonymizing the whole system. So what I said first, this is, was my logic. It, it was incorrect. But uh, then Aviv came with that. I'm still not exactly sure how they define unobservability in this case, but probably makes sense, I guess. Is, is that clear? My point was that I don't know the answer. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Can, can I ask uh, just one question? Like, how practical would it be, so, say, if we, if we did 10 megabytes of, of shared secrets between uh, two, each two participants in a 100 participant group how, how practical would that be like suppose right when uh, a coin join is happening um uh we would have only one round which would have you know let's say 10 megabytes of shared secret Lucas, you were saying something. Yes, I think that that we, what we were talking about uh, minutes ago. I mean, the the length of the key, it, it it is not important because you can generate a random key for I don't know, two hundred fifty six bits. Yes, for example, with a Diffie Hellman key exchange. And then you can uh, use a key derivation function to to create a key as long as you need. I mean, the, the, the length of the key that you need. So it's not that you have to share all that. So the only concern is that uh, we, we wouldn't know and we can't stop a malicious participant from, from ruining nice. the process, right? Yeah, I was also having a question about that. What incentivizes uh, people to, or disincentivizes people to be malicious and just broadcast that wrong number uh, in their XOR round or something like that? Well, it's the same that uh, motivates any malicious actor in a cryptographic network. It's it's that they have an incentive for something not to work, right? So in this case, it would be someone who has an incentive for secure payments not to work. Well, to be fair, the paper did not talk much about that. If, if at all, it was mostly assuming that everything, everyone is honest. So, yeah. But but again, let me reiterate that we are preparing for Queen Shuffle Plus Plus. So, Hopefully, Coin Shuffle Plus Plus will. Now we have a lot of questions, and Coin Shuffle Plus Plus will give us a lot of answers. <laughs> okay, I'm very much looking forward to it. Yeah, me too. Because I, I like the idea of this, but I was just thinking about this problem. Also, I, I, sh I should point out that there are no mainstream use cases for DC nets. So, you, you, if you tr if you go around and try to find active um, like applications that use DC nets, you you can't find them today, and very likely due to their narrow use of applications and also the fact that they have these problems. Well, uh, 
every every anonymity network come out of that right tor i2p uh sphinx what is the lightning network use um what has dandelion coin shuffle plus plus these are all based on this dc network research or, or this is the root of it by the way there is a new guy on the blog there is the lucky net it's an invention of one of the monero monero guys yes they have a it's a mix between something like a new 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 age tor and i2p uh, that looks interesting too they allow uh, communication using udp too and it, it, it is interesting i don't know it, it works uh, let me write it here it's lucky net um, it works I was playing with that <laughs> and it works uh, just to have in mind yeah that's interesting uh, another thing that came out recently is the NIM network you heard about it that uh, I think even Amir Taki was involved with it in one, at one point All right, what else topics you have? That's it for me. Then, then let's move on then. And the next, next uh, week we are obviously going to look into CoinShuffle++. Plus Plus. After that, we are looking into Cash Fusion, which is the Bitcoin Cash guys figure something out about an equal amount. And after that, we agreed that we are going to look into papers. Those are trying to quantify privacy. And and Aviv found a great research collection a bibliography of anonymity research which is freeheaven.net uh, slash anon bib and yeah th there is like a bunch of research it's, it's 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 really great like a bunch of research meaning thousands of anonymity research <laughs> Uh, okay and just a question don't we want to rename the Wasabi Research Club to Dining Bitcoiners <laughs> I don't oppose it would be fun but I'm too lazy to fix all the links and stuff <laughs> All right, guys, then thank you for the dinner and thank you for the NSC that paid our dinner. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, guys.